Hello there, I'm Mike Vargas, aka Prophet Song, and um, I spent some time out from doing music to basically come and help, come and give something onto the people that they desperate, desperately need at this time. They need hope. They need to know that the situation is not hopeless. Because we see all this fear from the media stirring up all this anxiety concerning the um, coronavirus. And there really is nothing to fear. And there's a reason they came upon us. And there's a reason and a plan and a purpose that God has for it. Um, this is something the devil meant for evil and God's turning it to good. And that's the way it's always been with God. That which was the devil meant for evil, God turns it to good. And this situation is actually no different. Um, I just want to share with you from Psalm 106, starting at verse 1. Praise ye the Lord, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endureth forever. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can show forth all his praise? Blessed are they that keep judgment, and he that doeth righteousness at all times. Praise ye the Lord. That word in the Hebrew basically means shine forth. Shine forth the Lord. Make him known. Give thanks unto the Lord. And it gives you a reason why you should give thanks unto the Lord. For he is good, and his mercy, his loving kindness, endures forever. And God is good. We realize that we've all sinned, we've all fallen short of His glory. So basically, we don't deserve anything from God but sin, death, hell, and the grave. That is why what we rightfully deserve. If we wake up in the morning and we have breath, we should be thankful for it. And if you woke up today and you're healthy, you should be thankful for it. Because God's been merciful. And you realize in the midst of this worldwide pandemic, God has still been merciful. Because if God wasn't merciful, there would be absolutely nothing left of the earth. Who can, verse 2, who can utterly utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can show forth his praise? Who can show it forth? Who can declare what God does? Who can make him known? Blessed are they that keep judgment, and he that doeth righteousness at all times. There's the key of the blessing. Blessed or happy, to be envied and prosperous, are those that keep judgment or justice. Is a more accurate word according to the way we speak today. Who can keep justice, and he that doeth righteous or right at all times nobody because we all sinned we all fallen short of the glory before God none of us are actually right because we all sinned we all broken his law Jesus in his mercy has sent his son to die for us to cover our sins and because of what he's done for us he is merciful to those that believe in him Remember me, and here, verse 4, this is where the psalmist goes, Remember me, Lord, with the favor that thou bearest unto thy people. O visit me with thy salvation, that I may see the good of thy chosen, that I may rejoice in the gladness of thy nation, that I may glory with thine inheritance. We have sinned with our fathers. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the Red Sea, even at the Red Sea. We go verse 7, verse 6. We have sinned with our fathers. We identify with the sins of those that come before us because 
from our ancestors or those who came before us, we have a genetic makeup that is prone to sin. We are prone to do evil as they did evil. And the psalmist is realizing we're no different. Our generation is no different from the generation before it, and that generation is no different from the generation before it. We still have a sin nature and we still are prone to do evil before God. That's why our very natures have to be changed in order to walk with God. That's why anybody who receives Christ into his heart he becomes a new creation. The old things have passed away and all things become new. He has to literally remake you in Christ so that you can walk with him. And that's the purpose of the cross, is to break down the dividing barrier. So that we don't go and sin like our fathers did. We have sinned with our fathers, we have committed iniqui iniquity or lawlessness. We have done wickedly or perversely. That word wickedly refers to perversely. So we have sinned, we have committed lawlessness, and we have done evilly. Right? So we as this nation have to admit that we have done evil just as the line before us has. Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. Now this speaks to us. Because God has delivered this nation from the very beginning. See, the U.S. was born and delivered from oppression of the crown in England. It was founded by Quakers who were fleeing religious persecution, who were forced to take part in a state-ran church and weren't free to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And they left Britain, came here for the hope of worshiping God freely. And the nation was built around these pilgrims. And the left has distorted that. But those were the first settlers. They were good, God-fearing people. Afterwards, evil came. But that wasn't so in the start. Well, let's go to verse 7. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake. No, our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. Remember not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the Red Sea. They became, they were delivered. Not to mention, the nation has been delivered by God several times. In the War of 1812, the um, British came to take the U.S. again. And Philadelphia ran for the second time in its history. See, there was two wars on U.S. soil. The Revolutionary War, in which everybody in Philadelphia literally ran from the British, the War of 1812, which everybody literally ran from the British again. In the War of 1812, the U.S. had no military, had no navy. It was basically one-sided conflict. And the President and the House of Representatives and the Senate, they all took off, and they were hidden or shut up in a church, and all they could do was pray to God. Well, at that time, the most severe storm that ever hit the United States hit at that time and literally wiped out the British Army. And the British never came back. And why could they come back? God fought that battle and won it. And the same thing happened with us in World War I and World War II. We had these victories because God blessed this nation. We were people that went into prayer and prayed for our military, and he gave us great victories. We were the people that came, and God used to deliver Israel in, in World War II. And because of it, God blessed us. And we have not understood the wonders that God brought about for this nation, this United States of America. For without the acts of God, this nation would not exist. 
Nevertheless, he saved him for his namesake, that he might make his mighty power to be known. That is the United States. We were saved, delivered, given victory, and made great for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it was dried up. He also led them through the depths as through the wilderness. And he saved them from the hand of them that hated them, and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. We were redeemed from the hand of those who hated us. The British hierarchy wanted to basically bring us into submission. God delivered us. God delivered us from the oppression of the crown at that time. And we don't realize we are a nation that has been delivered by God. Not to mention, we see it very clearly in the Revolutionary War. Because that's something that never happened before in history, where a people would lead a revolution manned by primarily farmers, because there was an army in the colonies that rebelled against the British king, but they ran. It was actually the farmers, the common folk, that won the battle. And our victory in the Independence War was total and a total impossibility for former craftsmen, farmers, craftsmen. And we were at war with what at the time was a major world power. And we won. And the victory was totally impossible. And the greatest part, the greatest mark on the entire Revolutionary War was Burgoyne, um, the British best battalion, the, the greatest general of the British Army, was defeated by the far Virginia farmers, common folks. They actually captured that army. And God chose these humble people to knock over the proud and we became a great nation and the waters covered the enemies and there was not one left we see that in the war in 1812 when the storm hit and delivered us from the British again there was not one soldier left it was a total massacre They soon forgot his works, and they waited not for his counsel. That's us today, because we have had this great deliverance. He brought us out from this odds. He brought us out and caused us to overcome in the spite of great odds. He brought back, he brought about miracles that delivered us. And we sit in that nation today, and we forgot what he did but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted him in the desert. This actually provides us. And he gave them their request and he sent on to them leanness of their soul. And they envied Moses in the camp also and Aaron the saint of the Lord. They envied. They were envious of their leadership and they mumbled against him. That's happening today, too. Because God put Donald Trump in the office of White House. What God did, he took, pushed aside the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. He picked somebody from among the people and placed them in the White House. This is exactly what happened. Because God was a step. So Donald Trump was actually established by God for a particular purpose. They envied Moses in the camp, also Aaron, the saint of the Lord. And he opened and swallowed up Dathan and covered up the company of Abiram. And a fire was kindled in their company, and a flame burned up the wicked. That's a rebellion that happened right after afterwards. And, and they made a calf in Horeb and worshipped the golden image. 
you know, that speaks to us today. Um, this is something that I see happening in the church, in the nation as a whole, but the church is actually the moral compass of the nation. And the church actually did this first. They made a calf in Horeb and worshipped the molten image. The molten image of this calf was actually an idol that was worshipped in Egypt. And Israel was delivered out of Egypt by God's great hand, by signs, miracles, and wonders. God unleashed ten plagues. Each was geared to shame something that the Egyptians worshipped. God literally led an assault on the Egyptian system of belief, proving that there was only one true God and he was it. Right? So what did Israel do at this point? They were impatient. Moses went up to the mountain to get the Ten Commandments and meet with God. Israel was waiting at the foot of the mountain and they became impatient. And they quickly forgot all the great things God did for them, bringing them out of Egypt. And he went they went to Aaron and coerced him to build a golden calf so they went back lost patience with him did not wait on the Lord wasn't interested in what he had to say they went and took one of the idols from Egypt that God just showed up created it started worshiping it and literally tried to replace the God that just led him out of Egypt and they were around this idol and they declared a festival unto the Lord they named this idol after the God that led him out of Egypt but it wasn't their God it was just something they made with their own hands and they're out there partying, doing all this kind of stuff. And that's basically the church at this point. They went, instead of coming out and being separate, they grabbed an idol from Egypt. Several idols. The church has been involved in basically self-worship. They've been worshipping power and influence and money. They put it all aside. They put that all in front of the Lord. Basically, they've been worshiping that calf and a whole bunch of different calves. Right? They forgot, in verse 21, they forgot, well, let me go a little further. Verse 20, they changed their glory into the similitude of an ox that either grass, or they exchanged their glory, and the word glory basically heaviness or weight, but gave Israel Israel weight was actually the presence of God. So they traded the presence of God for something that looked like an ox, which is actually a sacrificial animal. So they put the sacrificial animal above the God that is worshipped. They forgot God, their Savior which had done great things in Egypt. And we as a nation, we as a people, and the church as a whole, has forgotten this great God who brought us deliverance and healing over and over again. We've literally forgotten him days without number. And gone out and done our own thing. And that's where we are today. Let's go to verse 22. Wondrous works in the land of Ham and terrible things by the Red Sea. Therefore he said that he would destroy them had not Moses his chosen stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath that he should not destroy them. And this is the thing that saved Israel at this time because God said 
in light of what they did, God said he would destroy them. Going into Exodus, I remember teaching years ago from the book of Exodus, um, that situation where the Israelites built a golden calf. And Moses in, is before God. And God basically stops giving out the Ten Commandments. And he says, Moses, get down there right now. Why? The people, your people, who you brought out of Egypt, has defiled themselves before me. This verse is amazing because before that, God kept on referring to Israel as his people, which he brought out of Egypt. Now that they went and they sinned and they worshipped another God in this place, he disowned them, calling them Moses' people. Moses, your people, who you brought out of Egypt. God was distancing himself. And that's what happens when you turn to another God after he's done all these wonderful things. He distances himself from you. He disowns you. He pushes you away. You're no longer his. And the church with all of his idols, God has done this. Because we put everything before God. We're not a people that keep the Shabbat day holy. We used to have a national day where we just set aside for God. We've done away with that. It's still in the books, but it's not enforced. And the day was that was set aside for worship, and focusing on God and being grateful to God, we're doing all sorts of other things. We go to church and look at our watches because we want to be out there to basically look at the football game or go to a movie. Now God, what he has done, he has taken the football away, he's taken the, the movies away, the sports events away, the concerts away, those things that we put above God, God has actually taken that away from us. So that we can take a look at ourselves and get our hearts right before God at this time. And the thing that saved Israel at that time, they had a holy man that was able to go before him and intercede for the people. And that's where we're at today. We need people to come before God, repent, get cleaned up and then go into his presence and intercede for the nation so they'd be set right and that's what Moses was he was a holy man that went before God the Bible says if my people will call by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways I would hear from heaven forgive their sin and heal their land that's what we need to do now. Those who name the name of the Lord have to go before him. And have to seek his face, turn from their wicked ways. And we got wicked ways to turn from in the house of God. Because we endorse things that we shouldn't be endorsing. God said a homosexual will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And we endorsed it. God condemned the killing of innocent children. In the Old Testament, they call that Moloch worship. Today, we call it abortion. And those who are called by, the, by his name kept on saying it's okay. It's not. It's called innocent blood that was shed. And we have a church system here which is guilty of the shedding of innocent blood because you just endorsed this what God says is evil, which God says he will bring judgment upon him. And the shedding of innocent blood is severe because if you allow, say nothing, and actually endorse a lifestyle that God has cursed, and that person dies in their sin, God holds you accountable for that person's life. 
you'll be accountable for its blood. Um, and now is the place where we have to go before God and repent from that. Repent from our hypocrisy. Repent from our double standards. Repent, repent from taking things from the world. Idols that are worshipped in the world. Idols of entertainment. And they are idols. The world even calls them idols. Matinee idols. Right? Sports idols. Music icons. They're actually calling them things to be worshipped. And in our actions, we actually agree with it. It's okay to go out and basically enjoy something with the people you love. That's all right. But when that comes a controlling aspect of your life, it's not. There's only one thing that should control your life, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Your Creator is the one that has the right to set the standards in your life. And now we have to go before him and learn who he is. Because basically, we forgot. We did, we forgot who he is. And um, it's my open prayer that those that will hear this, especially those in the house of God, would turn to Christ, would confess the fact that we've done wrong in his sight, and if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sin. And the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But first, you have to acknowledge your sin. Just like they did in this psalm. We sinned. Let me go back to it. Verse... We sinned with our fathers, just like they did. We committed iniquity and have done wickedly. We acted just like those wicked people before us. We did it. You know, and you go into all the things that this psalm says. We done this. Nevertheless, he saved them, and nevertheless, he saved us in spite of us. Right? And we're the ones that he brought out. This is the nation that he brought out of Britain simply because they wanted to be free to worship. And this nation he established for himself. And that's the United States. It was established for God by a people that were seeking him out. So, and that's what we got to do. Seek him out, put our lives down before him, Turn from our sin and receive him into our hearts, and he will heal our land. It's important that God does it because man can't do it. President Trump is doing his best, but they can't do it. The only one that can do it is God. You can't rely on um, doctors and medicine, only can rely on Jesus Christ. God bless you.